This is Oliver Hewitson for Labour Tube. I'm joined today by Anthony Barnett, uh, his new book, The Lure of Greatness. Uh, he's here to talk about it today with us. So just firstly, how would you, how would you sum up uh, The Lure of Greatness uh, just briefly? Well, briefly, I, I think I'd sum it up by saying, why did I come to write it? And I wrote a book called Blimey, It Could Be Brexit, sort of chapter by chapter, week by week during the referendum, because I didn't think it would happen, but I thought it could happen. And that alone, I felt, really needed attention. How is it possible um, that, that Brexit might come about, despite everybody's expectations? And then it did happen. And, uh, and then Trump also followed. And so I, I set about trying to drill down a bit deeper. So it seems to me that, that and it's becoming clearer now that this is the case, that Brexit is quite a profound breakdown of traditional British government, just as Trump is a breakdown in the way America has governed itself and seen itself. And when that happens, uh, it, it's important to try and stop it. I'm not against people saying, let's stop it. But there's something about the way people say, stop it, which is about trying to sort of just revert back to what they regard as normal. And what was normal led to Brexit and Trump. So we have to do better than that. We've got to work out why they have happened, um, not in a kind of abstract way, but in order, as far as I'm concerned, uh, to reverse Brexit. And I hope the Americans will uh, rid themselves of Trump and his influence. So there's a purpose to the argument of looking at these causes so that we can address what people's real concerns and um, that's what I've tried to do in the book. And in terms of the causes, I see the following. I argue that, first of all, there's a profound loss of trust in the, the state system as a whole, uh, both, you know, Labour and Conservative. Uh, and this goes back politically to the Iraq war, in my view. And not just that the British state lied, but also it had made a judgment that it could win in Iraq and it would be backing an American victory in Iraq. And we, those of us who protested, the street, the one and a half million who were in the record sizes, the enormous opposition, we were wiser, the unwashed were wiser than the elite. Um, and, and I think a lot of people who did support the war, including many from working class communities who provided the servicemen uh, who gave their lives and who went out there and risked their lives, um, they at least expected, they weren't, they weren't as shocked as if what you might say the middle class, the professional classes were at the deceit. Uh, they sort of expected that, but they thought that if the whole of the state, both political parties, the, the foreign office, the secret services, the army, the military, if they all agreed that they could do it, they could win, then they backed that. And when we lost the defeat in Basra, and in, 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 in Helmand in Afghanistan were very considerable defeats which had been covered over by the sense of withdrawal. I think there was a very profound sense that these states that people were proud of, uh, these imperial states, we, we were about winning. Trump makes his point very emphatically and that loss also generated. So there was a, a double loss of trust, political and military trust in the strategic position uh, of the two main Anglo-Saxon countries. Uh, and then that was then followed by the financial crash and a sense that, first of all, we were lied to, then we were lost, then uh, the whole economic system that we had been told, been trusted, crashed. And then they looted us with the quantitative easing so that in the decades since the financial crash, uh, the rich have got considerably richer, their banks have been saved, um, and the, a regular person's salaries have flatlined or gone down, and there's been an extraordinary increase uh, in insecurity and precarity. You see this in house prices, in debt. So there's a profound alienation from the, a, a dual system, a dual party government of both Labour and Conservative. And one aspect of the Brexit vote was that finally people were asked the question, do you want us to carry on as we are? And very understandably, uh, if wrongly, people said no. 
they did not. And when I say wrongly, I mean that leaving the European Union is not the solution to the catastrophe of government that we have witnessed. Another reason for Brexit, which I didn't go on about much, but I emphasise quite strongly, is the nature of the European Union itself and its undemocratic character. Uh, and the, the arguments about that I regard as, as you know, completely justified. But uh, I would put it like this, that in my view, uh, what happens to our continent is what happens to us. If Europe goes neo-fascist or undemocratic, which it could do, we've just seen the elections in Austria, then this country will as well. If Europe is prosperous and democratic, this country can be as well. And that the fight for Europe is the fight for the nature of, of British society, and we can't separate ourselves from that. But without any doubt, one of the causes of Brexit was uh, the actual nature of the European Union. And another reason for Brexit that I argue about is that the, um, the left, not just the Labour Party, but the left as a whole, had no real convincing vision of what a democratic Europe should look like. There was no positive message about what an alternative Europe could really be, certainly not one that got communicated to the public. So all those were very profound and important reasons for Brexit, but there was an additional one, which if you like is the heart of the book so far as Brexit is concerned and this country is concerned. And you could dramatise it in this way. All these factors were true in Scotland, but Scotland voted to remain. All these factors were true in London. Economically, London has benefited, so not as true, but still the political ones was true. And London voted to remain. But they, the same factors led what I call England without London to vote by an 11% majority to leave. So I argue that these forces were, went through, if you like, the eye of the needle of a, an English nationalism. And it was a frustrated Englishness which drove Brexit. And one of the very striking things for me about this argument is that I lay it out, I look at the figures, the percentages are absolutely striking. Every region, every class of England without London, even when you include in that the other big cities that voted uh, uh, to remain in the European Union, everywhere there was a majority vote to leave. But no one will talk about this. You know, we, the, the BBC went off and interviewed, you know, working class guys in Newcastle with bad teeth and, and sort of blamed the, the quote left behind as if they, you know, the, 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 the many, there were millions of voters, two to three million voters, who had given up on the system, and many of them, for example, the moving account of what happened in the black country, who were traditional Labour voters, had stopped voting and came out for the ballot. Uh, so that was an, a, a contributing cause, but they were by no means, uh, you know, you don't get to a 52% a vote, you don't get a 17.4 million. By those, so it was, it was a predominantly a conservative and a southern and a vote of the, of the English relatively well off but squeezed and very insecure and feeling very frustrated. So what are the causes of this English dissatisfaction? Why did England blame Europe for uh, uh, its frustrations? And that question is one that I ask very emphatically and it's striking to me, if I can say this, that in Ireland or in, uh, uh, in France uh, or now in New York, people are very interested in these answers. But the, with the exception of a review in The New Statesman, um, the British newspapers and Open Democracy, which I've, I, I helped to found and which has been covering the, the issues and I, which I write in regularly, they don't want to know. They, they, it's like saying you say, look, the car's bust, and they say, yeah, let's get it moving, we'll push. And I say, well, why didn't you open the bonnet? And they say, well, we do not want to open the bonnet. Um, and I've opened the bonnet. Now, what do we see there if we open the bonnet? Well, now, it is odd to say that this is an English vote because, you know, the English want Britain. They want this to be Great Britain. They want global Britain. They, they're not asking for an English parliament, another layer of government. Um, 
but a number of studies have shown that um, the you know they did there was one survey which I thought was really striking and illustrative of this which went and asked people what do you think is the layer of government that has the most influence over your lives and remote areas of Europe like Galicia would say 9% might say the European Union in Wales it was 6% uh, in Scotland it was 4% and in England it was 30% now the European Union is quite influential but it's not the most influential layer of government. So 30% of the English are completely wrong in thinking that the European Union is the thing that is governing their lives more than anything else. And the people that did the survey thought perfectly reasonably, it seems to me, that the reason why the English thought that, obviously in a rather hostile way, is that they have no government of their own that speaks for England. And it's very striking this. The, uh, England is a historic country, a proud country, one with a lot of self-consciousness. A majority of the people that live in England when asked now describe themselves as English rather than British. Yet not only is there not a single institution that represents them that says we are, you know, there's an English health service, there's English heritage, there's enormous sums of money, there's an, a lot of cultural capital, if you want to call it that, at stake. There's not a single institution of a representative kind whose role is to represent the interests of England. Nor is there a single think tank whose aim is to look at English interests. Uh, and when you say, well, look, you know, there's there's a Scottish TUC and then there is a British TUC. There is a, there's a Church of Scotland and there's the Church of England, but the Church of England, you know, ha, it, it, it's a world church. It's looking after Anglicanism around the world. So that there is a British broadcasting company and there is a Scottish broadcast BBC and there's a Welsh BBC and there's a Northern Irish BBC, but there's not an English BBC. So England is, is has uh, no way of expressing itself. and. One of the reasons why for this, I argue, is that England expresses itself in what I call Anglo-Britishness. It, it assumes the right to rule Scotland and Wales and, it, and that, uh, uh, that Britishness is constitutionally incompatible with membership of the European Union. And this allowed the English to blame Europe for their ills, when their ills are really centred, the source of their ills is centred on Westminster. Okay, just sticking on, on, on identity, you mentioned a minute ago for the time being, uh, there's a section in your book you talk about Paul Mason's uh, article in which he talks about his general sort of uh, discomfort with being English. Uh, and this has been a very common theme uh, from a lot of, of, you know, of the English left uh, in particular. Um, in a way that you don't really seem to encounter on the continent that much. Um, what role do you feel that, that this sort of um, discomfort with Englishness played in the referendum? And I suppose if the British left had had a more European uh, attitude to national identity, do you think the result would possibly have been different? Well, I think if the, yeah, yeah, yes, if the British left, and that would have meant a very large section of the British people, the Labour Party had felt comfortable with being English, uh, I think we would still be inside the European Union, just as the Scots and Londoners uh, and the, the Irish feel comfortable inside the European Union. Not that they're not very critical of it, but that they can share sovereignty without feeling shame and without feeling an existential sense that they've been reduced to serfs or second-rate people. Sovereignty is something you share. We live in an absolutist, sovereignty, monarchical system, in which, you know, somehow we haven't got that language of sharing. And where it comes down to the in English aspect of this is um, the very peculiar and in some ways once very advantageous nature of Englishness. So Paul Mason, who you mentioned, whom I criticise, and who I generally think 
is an absolute one. He's a real thinker on the left. He's original. He, 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 he writes very well. He's very clear. His argument about network against hierarchy and his book, Post-Capitalism, is one that I think is very forcefully and well made. And, his, and he's a general columnist I always read and attend to. But he wrote this column saying, I am an English person, but I don't want to be English. I don't regard myself as politically English. And my identity is in my language. The English language is the world language. That's good enough for me. Well, of course, the English language is, you know, if you're an American or a Canadian or a Jamaican, you know, the English language is also your world language. Or if you're a middle class Indian, but you, you know, you don't, you still have a nationality. So what is it that about the being English, which allows you to say such an extraordinary thing? And one answer to this, which does go back to the language and Shakespeare and so on, is that England was, and there's quite a lot of work has been done on this, the first nation. It was the prime mover in terms of being a European nation, consciously stuff, which then developed the, uh, both the legal system, the imperial system, and then the Industrial Revolution. And unleashing the Industrial Revolution, then built on the enormous advantages that that gave it as an industrialized nation, the world's largest empire. And the other nations from China to the United States, to France, to Germany, to Russia, found themselves having to forge their, their, their nationness, forge themselves as nations against, not just English, but in the first place, um, English power. Whereas we English didn't have that fight, we became a nation without without needing to do so. So English has always had this advantage. We were, if you like, the Google, if you want to know, of, of, of search engines, right? We were, we created search, if you see what I mean. We created what it meant to be a nation. And then we absorbed Scotland. Scotland had a bash at being its own imperial country, lost its fortune in Darien in the in the Panama Isthmus, and then and then they you know partly with bribery, but we, we absorbed, we already conquered Wales, was, Ireland was more difficult, but, and, 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 and by the end of the beginning of the 19th century, it was a united nations, we had absorbed our, into a sort of multinational entity, which then was able, and indeed gave kind of imperial citizenship to countries all around the world, and we dominated that. So our own nationality had this kind of openness, it had a, a, a and that meant it did have a kind of a liberal and it could have a kind of progressive aspect. And we English have inherited this uh, and think, well, you know, we're different from everybody else. We don't need to be, uh, uh, to go on about our nation. We, kind of, we can assume uh, that it's fine. And this is actually a form, this is English nationalism. English nationalism on an international and a cultural level is a way of saying we don't need to bother with all this. We're better than that. And that came from being first, but we are no longer first. Brexit is going to teach a very big lesson to this country of the arrogance implicit in not needing to be like other people. No, right? We now must become a modest, regular country like other people. And embracing, saying to, and this is what I, I say to Paul Mason, Becoming English is a way of becoming democratic. It's a way of becoming a real part of the world. But it's very, very painful. It's very difficult. And there was this moment with the Olympics when, with the opening ceremony, with Danny Boyle's opening ceremony, where Britishness was being redefined as no longer imperial, but it was about the NHS, and it was about gay kissing, and it was about uh, um, the, the World Wide Web, and it was about being, uh, being very inclusive and being open and very modern and and solidarity uh, and therefore it was trying to forge a kind of British nationalism, Anglo-British nationalism of a very progressive kind. Brexit has rolled that back. Brex Britishness is now our precious union, is dominating. Brexitness, Britishness is now Brexitness. That's what Brexit has done. And this is no longer acceptable. It won't be acceptable to the Scots in the long run. It clearly won't be acceptable to the Irish in the long run, or even in the medium term. And we've got to shake this off. And the way to do so, the way to gain back to being a, a multinational part of the world, is by giving 
normalizing what it means to be English politically. Is part of this a resentment against people, the people identified with the strongest uh, sort of Europhilia? Um, is this a sense of um, people who other parts of the country on social classes may feel have a, a sort of disproportionate amount of cultural power and these people love the EU? Is that part of why some people thought, well, I'm going to vote against the EU then? Yes, I, I think uh, uh, certainly there was a resentment at the governing classes and at the you know the degree of inequality which is expressed in their lifestyles and uh, and also in their familiarity with the foreign and with the strange and that they're doing well out of it and um, they're generally being very patronizing towards those who find it who haven't got more than 500 pounds in their savings account and find it very hard are very anxious and are living under tremendous sort of stress and strain and the precarity of of a, a social and economic system since, especially since the uh, since the crash and being told by these people you know they should be more competitive and and producing all the sort of uh, hollowing out of the state and trying to mimic the marketplace and it's all very well for them but it's 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 it's, it's uh, it's very bad for us and I completely agree with that but it doesn't come from the European Union right it's the the anger against that that system which is something I think I describe I go out of my way to understand and the reason I do is I think you won't reverse Brexit unless you can address that sense of anger and that sense of uh, cultural rage uh, you know address that part of it which is valid and come up with some a different answer and the answer that I come up with is to say that one of the reasons that we feel trapped in this in this English system is the if I could because I think the people don't aren't quite aware of the way the constitutional system works you had we had an imperial constitution with a monarchy with an army uh, with the civil service uh, with British businesses which have now mostly been sold uh, uh, to foreign corporations in which we believed it was a system Parliament was if you like the church of that system the assembly of that system and it fed you ways of being satisfied from military victory to positions in the army to the role of the church to the role of the to the the general order of things which in which you participated and which had gone through this extraordinary test in the Second World War. And what happened then, I argue, is that we went to war in 1939, we as an empire, very consciously, and emerged as a country. And that, that national country that emerged was one that were in which people still felt fully represented. Now what's happened post Thatcherism and then post Blair's, you know, the, the sort of disintegrative constitutional reform is that all that structure of representation of our feeling that we have got, we're, we're in this system, we have some voice in it, has been broken. The Scots have a parliament, the judges are now very different, the House of Lords is obviously corrupt, it's just cronies, you know, there's the, parli the, the ex parliamentary expenses, they're all sort of racketeers, they're in it. The, the, the whole thing has been marketized and, and in that sense, therefore, in that system, you, uh, uh, your, your frustration has no location with which you can't identify with the system of government. And that produces a kind of a rage. And that rage, which has been generated by a breakdown in government, has taken it out on membership of the European Union. So a large part of the book, uh, as we discussed, is about the sort of uh, the, the constitutional uh, weakness of England with regard to Britain. Uh, the EU's constitution, uh, by contrast, uh, the imposition of the Lisbon Treaty, you describe as miserable, secretive, sly and duplicitous. Um, if we take instance or episodes like the Lisbon Treaty, uh, along with episodes like Greece, uh, the bailout, uh, TTIP, um, to what extent is, is it the EU's own ideologies uh, and errors uh, that led to Brexit? First of all, I think the European Union is the most wonderful and progressive 
institutional creation uh, of my lifetime. Of that the nations which had uh, gone to war with unimaginable ferocity and, and, and horror, decades after decades, over two to three centuries, uh, consciously decided to both their leaders and their people to put that aside, to live in peace, to work together, to bring down their barriers, to bring down their borders, to work in terms of scientific research, in terms of culture uh, together, uh, was, is, is the most uh, remarkable and amazing achievement. And that, that sense that it is, we can now be proud to be European and that it's wonderful to travel across Europe and Europe, uh, this continent is our home is, is, and it's a made achievement, it's achievement of governments. So that is an enormous positive. Where the European Union leaders made a big mistake after the unification of Germany and coming out of the Maastricht Treaty was to go for a single currency without being willing to uh, uh, basically they had a kind oddly enough um, they had a sort of a Marxist view that they thought that the politics would follow um, the 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 economy and they did something which was to they created the currency and then the very narrowly by, by was supported in terms of the the referendum in France they went ahead with that um, and then they decided that given that they had this currency that they had to constitutionalize they had to actually so to speak make us citizens while acting from above and constitutionalize this framework in order to democratize it and they put that constitution, which is a long and elaborate document, to the people in France and in Holland. Now, Holland is the most European country in a way there is, the one where population speaks the least, from what I can see, almost the entire population of Holland speaks at least two, if not three, languages. And they were thunderously rejected. And at that point, the leaders of the European Union, the leading, both the people in Brussels, but also uh, uh, the heads of state, including Blair, went ahead to create the Lisbon Treaty, which effectively imposed the constitution that had been rejected. So, in, so you have a, a currently a European Union the, it, whose constitution has been created in the teeth of opposition, knowing that the people didn't want it and deciding that at some point or other, in some way or other, the people would come round to it. And therefore assuming that the elite knows better, and it's built into the culture of the governing culture of the European Union, that you don't have a re referendums of vermin, right? That the, the voice of the people should not be heard, that they know better. And that, in an age, now the age of the internet, an age where people want democracy and they want self-government, is a profound cultural and, and political flaw and it means that they don't know how to actually speak to regular people we can now see this in Catalonia that it's it's it and this is a, a terrible legacy right it's not even a legacy it's a terrible it's a terrible thing which has happened but when we look at it there's a, something about the way the Anglo-British talk about this which is very odd and I think very revealing they talk about this as if it's uh, as if this is a fixed monster, a legal system we can do nothing about, something which makes us powerless. Um, whereas we have a 350-year-old broken, undemocratic, top-down settlement, uh, which exists to preserve itself through thick and thin, which is much more difficult to change than the European Union. The European Union has been constitutionalizing itself and reconstitutionalizing itself more or less every decade. There was Rome, there's Maastricht, there's Lisbon, there are other summits as well. And so the European Union is quite a weak, one of the reasons for their re reaction to Brexit is it's quite a, a weak and in a way rigid, threatened system of government. It's an exploratory, it's inventive. And if the people of Germany and France or of England, if we were in it and Spain and Italy, were to say, we do not want this, it wouldn't happen. 
the European Union has got no, in one sense, it has got, doesn't yet have an army of its own. It doesn't have its own police force. It, it can't impose its will. That's one of the reasons why it doesn't like democracy. It's got no, so, so the European Union is eminently reformable. It is, an, it is a wonderful inventive process that has gone wrong, but can be corrected. It is our union. It is our, it's the way we're governing our, and, uh, and, and to be outside of the currency and therefore outside of that process of being of the shared currency with all of its, of its uh, faults of austerity and, def and its deflationary effects on the countries outside Germany, and yet still to be inside the European Union, as Poland is, for example, and it's growing at 4% per annum in terms of its economy, that is a great position to be in. So there's something odd here, and I, I'm very struck by um, uh, uh, Lamont, Norman Lamont was once uh, uh, um, asked, you know, well, if you're so opposed to the lack of democracy in the European uh, Union, why are you in the House of Lords? And he kind of simpered, <laughs> you know, well, he said, you know, so I, I didn't make up the, the, the House of Lords, you know, I didn't make up the British system, as if sort of, this is something he has to be part of while taking no responsibility, although it's our own country, but uh, when it comes to the European Union, he's on his high horse and we can't have this and we can't have that. So there's, there's the, the critique of the lack of democracy in the European Union is, is partly put in bad faith by many of those who put it in this country. Its, its lack of democracy is seen as somehow definitive, unmovable, immensely tough and, and threatening. And our own long historic lack of democracy is seen as something, well, we're familiar with it, it's not so bad, we can work around it. And, and this, is, this is resulting in Brexit, which as I say, is a very profound breakdown of governance in this country. But I mean, the the examples you give of being able to to change the EU. I mean, obviously, you know, Britain has uh, an incredibly imperfect democracy. But if we think about uh, you know, 1945, 1979, 2016, people of this country still do and have had the means uh, to you know uh, to bring about quite sort of fundamental, profound change in the country. Um, the changes that the EU has gone through, uh, by contrast, um, have all been top down. Uh, at no point have the people of Europe imposed uh, a sort of transformative change upon the EU or its structures. Uh, I mean, you know, the Brexit vote itself, it's probably you know, the first major thing to do that. It was a national vote. Um, you know, in, in what sense would you, would you say that from what we've seen uh, over the last few decades, in what sense is the EU there to be reformed by the people of Britain, the people of the Netherlands, the people of France? Well, well that's a very good question. Well, first of all, you're right that there have been uh, very big transformations in in this country, and they have been in part driven by popular forces. Although I think 1979 is rather dubious in that sense. It was a big change; it released a lot of en pent up energy. But there were other routes that could have been taken. Thatcherism wasn't. There were alternatives to Thatcherism, and they also would have released that energy that was building up in the 70s. Uh, uh, was going to, you know, express itself in one way or another. This, this is a country of failed renewal. It's not a country which is now suffering just simply decline. It's been the, but but Germany has renewed itself. Has gone through very profound changes, including a very great reckoning with what it did during the war. My generation of Germans went through a very, very, very profound sense of actually kind of coming to a reckoning with their with their parents' generation who were. Uh, either Nazis or were collaborating to the Nazis on the whole. And, and you know, it's, it, France has gone through very big changes, including getting rid of Algeria and de Gaulle, and it's gone through, Spain used to be a fascist country and it is no longer, and it's, and it's still arguing out the nature of, of what's going on. So it's not at all the case that, that we alone have done this. You just merely need to look at, at Ireland. What well, Ireland was a benighted, Catholic, backward society, and now, uh, um, you know, Ireland is about to have a referendum on the legalization of abortion, the legalization of gay marriage. I mean, you know, these are very big changes that are taking place uh, 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 across Europe. And one of the frameworks that has permitted these kinds of changes and allowed them to consolidate themselves has been the fact that we've not been at war with each other, right? That the, the old nationalisms have been put aside. 
and that has been willed by the people of Europe in different ways. So that's the first thing to say. And Europe is a uh, um, is is a form of sharing of sovereignty, not a new sovereignty imposing itself on us. Now, there's an element inside uh, Brussels and inside the European Union which does seek to become another imperial power. There is that element. That's a fair criticism of it. But what I'm saying is, is that this is still a very weak, although it's a, a, a very ambitious and anti-democratic uh, 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 sort of project, if you like. It's not one that finds support in the chancellors is or in the with the presidencies or in Downing Street. It's not one that that the the prime ministers and the presidents or, and the chancellors of Europe leap to. On the contrary, they are opposed to it. And we need, this is where I support what Yanis Varoufakis is arguing for, we need a European movement that is rooted in a popular will to set about changing the way Europe is governed and the values by which Europe governs itself. Let me give you an example. I, so it's by Boris Johnson kept on saying, well, look, when I was mayor of London, you know, and I tried the, the, these lorries, they started to crush cyclists and they wanted to change the nature of the lorries, but I couldn't change them because of some regulation which was there in Paris, the French, the French didn't want their lorries changed. Why didn't he make an appeal to cyclists across Europe to simply cycle to Paris and put, bring Paris to a halt until it changed its view, if that was the case? So they said, oh my goodness me, we've got to suffer, we've got to suffer what, what Europe says. You know, the, 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 the constitution which they proposed was vetoed by a French referendum and a Dutch referendum. There is, there is popular support across Europe for a different kind of Europe. And, and what I'm saying is that we need a European politics which builds on that. And if you say, well, it hasn't happened, as I think I see you leaping out. Well, you know, it's a very young uh, organization, the European Union, and we've now got to find a new way forward. I suppose what I'm getting at is, is you give the examples of the, the Dutch and the French uh, vetoes uh, of the, uh, the Constitution, but of course they weren't vetoes because they can only be done at a national level because there are no levers with which the people of Europe can bring that sort of change that would allow them to veto a referendum, uh, a constitution, to yeah. reject a, a constitution, to amend it, etc. So what they're left with is more, uh, you know, you know, just sort of messages from their own countries, you know, referendums, elections. They have no real means of of leverage uh, yeah. on the institutions of the EU. So this is my first point. Uh, coming back to the example of the British equivalents, the second point you say with regards to to Johnson, you know, simply round up cyclists from across Europe. And I think this is, uh, you know, this is the same point that applies to to Varoufakis and you know DM twenty five. Uh, again, is it is it not one of the you know the weaknesses of of the EU from a democratic perspective? That not only have you got the difficulties you have within a national uh, polity of, of driving change, but you've now got a uh, you know secure uh, you know a majority support for what you want to do across twenty eight countries. I mean, how you know, in, in what sense do you, do you have a better? democratic grasp, uh, having to work across 28 countries, very different cultures, languages. You know, in what sense does that compare to national democracy such as Britain? Right, well, I'm not against national democracy. I'm not for uh, losing national democracy. No, no, no. I'm what not what for I mean is you, you suggested that there is an equivalence with the EU and that we shouldn't view you know, British politics as something that we can impact on. We shouldn't view the EU as something we cannot impact on because of the examples given. So what I'm saying is, uh, you know, uh, how, how would you justify the claim that we do have the means and the leverage to change the EU's institutions that we do at home? It, it, we don't have the same leverage over the European Union, or we wouldn't have had if we'd stayed in the European Union, which I hope we will do, uh, than if uh, we, we as voters have over our own uh, government. Um, but I'm not against, I, I'm, not, I'm not in favour of uh, the European Union becoming a single country. And the votes of the people of Holland and France 
actually said they didn't wish this. There isn't a democratic consent for that. So I am for the nations of Europe sharing their sovereignty over areas where this clearly benefits us. It clearly benefits us in terms of education. It's clearly essential in terms of climate change. We ought to be able to do it in terms of agriculture. We, we, it benefits us in terms of the single market. If we can make things which can then travel, you know, without barriers across the European Union. And, and in order for that to happen, there has to be a shared regulatory space with shared, shared laws of trade and and not just of trade, but if you want to sell financial services and if you want to share products, then you need to actually have a regulatory uh, environment which is unified. And then together that makes a regulatory uh, unit which can then trade you know, with some strength uh, in terms of other uh, competitors around the world. So you know, all that seems to me to be something which is uh, uh, obviously good and extremely difficult to arrive at and it shouldn't involve the liquidation of national politics it doesn't mean that we can't have a health service which is different from the health services of other countries it doesn't mean that we can't have the government of our towns and cities in terms of you know we of how we drive it or how we you know a lot very large amounts of how we are, are, are govern ourselves remain part of our own government and if you go to Germany or you go to Italy or you go to France, you know you're in a, a different country which is also sharing sovereignty with your own. And th that is a difficult thing to do and that the European Union is failing to do it in terms of its economic policies and in terms of German domination of the Euro. Yes, of course that's right. But my fundamental argument here is that the fate of Europe is our fate you could even say it to be over dramatic, perhaps with appeasement. We tried to walk away. We, as when we were an empire, when this country was an empire, tried to walk away from the European Union, and the result was a catastrophic war, and this was a catastrophe for us, uh, as well. The one saving grace of this war was that British Britain wasn't itself invaded and its institutions weren't overturned. But one result of that is we now still have institutions which are deeply embedded in the 19th century imperial values uh, and imperial consciousness with the great nostalgia for that period, um, which is a, a, a fatal drawback in the, in the modern world. So I think that uh, uh, you need to start with the other things that, you know, this is our continent. Its fate is our fate. We have to be part of that argument. We can lose that argument, we can win that argument, but it's our argument and it's our continent and it will decide how, what kind of a country we are. And we can't separate ourselves from that. We can't say, well, well Europe can be as undemocratic as it wishes to be and on and so on, and we're going to be completely different. And, you know, and there's even a sort of a lexiteer argument uh, that we can introduce a kind of, you know, egalitarian democratic socialism in, in the United Kingdom, right? So that the United Kingdom will become a, a democratic socialist uh, 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 sort of, you know, example to the rest of the world, show the rest of the world how to be, while, while Europe becomes a reactionary, semi-fascist, sort of populist, uh, uh, oppressive, undemocratic place, you know, this is this is very unlikely, to put it mildly. Sure, but I mean, I think um, I, mean, I mean, your views on the the sort of relative uh, strengths between the national and the and the transnational uh, are one thing. And you said in the book, um, you said a few times that the the sort of the you know the, the federalists uh, have lost. Uh, the super state is no longer on the agenda. Uh, you know, Brexit is essentially the end on on, on that side of the project. Um, but isn't there a sense in which, uh, you know, for the Federalists themselves, uh, Brexit is really the beginning of that process and that now without the sort of difficult neighbour that was Britain in the way, they feel that actually this is exactly what's needed and what they need to do and what they, they now have the freedom to do. I mean, if you look at Juncker's speech, um, 
there, there's no sense at all in which this is a this is a defeat for for federalism. This is a you know, the, the, you know this is a real embrace for them that they feel this is really the time and this is the opportunity now that they have to push forward. Um, you know, monetary union, fiscal union, banking union, you know, European defence, you know, etc. Et um, I mean. Is it not the case that really Brexit is, is just going to give more force uh, to centralisation in Europe now? Well, I think that Brexit was a reactionary uh, and, and negative uh, blow to which the European Union will respond by strengthening its own reactionary and negative aspects. Um, Juncker's always struck me as a rather um, unconvincing figure. He's on his way out. Um, his struggles with alcohol are well known. I've never taken him very seriously. I take Merkel seriously. I think Macron is very interesting. I think his attempt to push a kind of modern federalist model is very likely to fail. I think you've seen the rise again now in Austria of the far right. Is, is, is a, uh, given the nature of the European Union, it's got to proceed by agreement. It means that the, this federalist model that, that you have uh, outlined, it may be the wet dream of bureaucrats in Brussels, but it's, it's not going to come about if the people and governments of Europe don't want it. Um, and, and we should be part of stopping, stopping that. And we, you know, the, 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 we, we, it's quite a, a difficult one. The thing where I, I haven't been able to make up my mind on the euro is whether my instinct, which is um, it should be abandoned because the logic of the euro is such a profoundly anti-democratic one, it is bound to fail. So the sooner you cut your losses, the better. Or whether the argument of those who know their economics better than I do of saying the costs of trying at this point in time to unwind the euro are too great and that it is a fait accompli, it can't be. The European nations who are part of it can't undo it um, and that they're sort of stuck with it uh, and it therefore needs to be governed in a completely different way which, which you know, which, which liberates the energy of, of, of cities and of, of municipalities and of different countries and allows people to borrow and gives people real flexibility in terms of their different economies. Um, I, but at the moment, that, that's, uh, that's not our argument. That's not an argument for us. Our, the argument for us is um, how do we reverse Brexit? How do we stop it if it can be stopped? And how do we reverse it uh, if it can't be stopped? You've said quite openly that what, that what you'd like to see happen now uh, is for, for Britain to rejoin the EU. Um, what sort of plausible routes to that happening uh, do you foresee and what role do you think Labour should be playing in that? Well, I can understand what I think is the position that the Labour leadership, which itself has disagreements, uh, uh, the position that they have come to. They've said, well, we're not really, you know, Jeremy Corbyn's will, I give Europe seven and a half out of ten. We're not really very keen on Europe. We're, we're part of it. We're there. It's not what really concerns us. Um, and but we we were for remaining. Let's be practical. Jobs better for people. Uh, now we're out. We accept the referendum result, um, and uh, we'll we'll get cracking. We need to go about all the things that we need to do. Give people jobs. Uh, get a grip on British industry. Um, get rid of all these PFIs and stop the financial services from ripping us off and and tax the very rich to help the very poor um, and and Europe let Europe let the Tories fight it out it's their fight and they'll tear themselves to pieces on it um, and if they do and if it all goes very badly wrong then maybe we'll we'll say oh, we, we can't accept a no deal this is a catastrophe We've got to stay within the, the general regulatory space. This is a space of government. We're not going to allow the extreme Brexiteers with that ultra deregulation and bringing in a sort of hormone rattled American beef and destroying our agriculture. We're not going to allow that. So we need to stay within the general sphere of Europe. We're not against it. 
And if it all goes really pear-shaped, we'll support another referendum. And if there's another referendum, we'll say, you know, let's stay in and British people then stay in and then we can get back into power and we'll make a, you know, if it's Brexit, we'll, we'll deal with that. And if it's not Brexit, we'll deal with that. And I can see that's quite a tempting way of not trying to uh, take a, a, a risky position, not trying to lead. The danger of this is that um, Brexit is an expression of a very dangerous force, which is nationalism, which can be a very a force for good and it can be a force for great ill and very uh, uh, divisive and very violent. And it's about who we are as a country, what kind of country we want to be. It's not just a matter of policy. And the way I've been putting it in the book and now in some articles I've been writing about it, is this, that Jeremy Corbyn and Corbyn's Labour Party have been very good on the tangible issues of, of we've just seen this on the 55p a minute for, the, uh, uh, for, for ringing up, trying to get universal health care, uh, uh, your universal sort of benefits. Um, they've been very good on the issues, the moral and human issues that people understand completely wrong or completely unfair but in addition to the tangible there are these intangible forces which work right who is governing us how are we how do you, what kind of country are we where is our standing in the world and these these affect if you like the capacity of a, of a party to become hegemonic in the way that Thatcherism was or you could way, argue in the way that Attlee was in other words to set the terms within which policies are then carried out and Brexit directly affects what kind of country we are and how we want to run ourselves. And it does so in a 21st, it's there in the 21st century. We can't go back to a kind of Keynesian, let's have a bit of growth, moderate, improve, you know, uh, get capital work. We've got platform capitalism. We've got the great American corporations like Google. We've got a sort of a network dynamism taking place. And this is doing so on a continental as well as global scale. So Labour needs to actually address this to be to be seen as and for people to feel that it's actually dealing with these issues. Now, the Tories at the moment under May have clearly just collapsing. So everybody can feel that they're absolutely no good and we need something better. But there remains the danger that a Brexiteer, a, a Michael Gove, if you will, perish the thought, but a Michael Gove who is clear, who is articulate, who will take these issues by the throat and, and will try to make a fist of Brexit uh, addressing those terms. And the country is in a very febrile state. They, want, they don't want these issues to be dealt with. And if there's a Brexiteer who shows a serious ability to deal with the tangible and has got is clear and coherent on these in, intangible defining issues then a labor attempt to sort of shuffle back into europe without really making it a priority for it uh, could well fail so i think that while i understand the care with which they've consolidated their current position to let the tories implode if you will Labour will need to come up with real answers about what kind of country we are. And I hope it will say we should be at the very least a confederation of nations, that England should have an equal, be in an equal position to Scotland and to Wales and to Northern Ireland if Northern Ireland doesn't want to join Ireland as a whole, which it will do eventually, that's clear and it's inscribed in the Good Friday Agreement. And that we want to put, you know, the, the precious union of Great Britain, one state behind us, that that's an em what I call an empire state, then to move on to that, to get rid of the House of Lords, to have proportional representation, to become, if you like, a modern European democracy and be capable with a constitution based on, upon a convention process, based on the popular processes that are national, you, as you rightly say, to be able to share what we can share and want to share with other countries in Europe as a European country.